Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the PFA speaker series session that we have today. Uh, thank you so much for making time out of your weekend uh, to join us. And thank you to Tanshri as well for agreeing uh, to have a chat with us on, uh, I think, what is a very interesting topic. Uh, before we kick uh, things off, uh, I'd like to just invite Ms. Tika, the president of PFA, to um, provide some welcoming remarks. Thanks so much, um, Amira, and I'm sure everyone's looking forward to today's session as well. I know I am. Um, and thank you so much to Tantri and Drew for agreeing to be a part of our session today. Um, just as a brief introduction, PFAA is um, our Perdana Fellows Alumni Association, um, and we are comprised of over 800 uh, fellows in Malaysia, um, made out of uh, Perdana Fellows who were attached to um, ministries and also corporate fellows. Um, so we have an array of um, people um, who are a part of the session today coming from various and very diverse backgrounds, um, professionals and also students. So I hope that everyone would be able to learn as much as possible um, and just ask as many questions as you can during our Q&A. So looking forward to, the, to today's session. Yeah, okay. so um, before we jump into the topic, um, so what's going to happen in terms of structure today, uh, I think Dan has some presentation. He'll uh, talk about uh, essentially the topic we have at hand today. And towards the end, we'll have uh, about half an hour for Q&A session uh, where you, you can, uh, for participants in the Zoom meeting, you can leave your questions in the chat or you can raise your hands. Uh, for those of you joining us on Facebook, you can also share your questions uh, in the Facebook chat uh, and we will uh, relay that to uh, Tanshri later on. Uh, yeah, so uh, a brief introduction I think is warranted uh, to the amazing guests that we have today. Um, so essentially, just a, uh, to have a um, although I think, it, you know, there's not really an introduction needed uh, to introduce him. So Tanshi Andrew is a prominent technocrat and commentator on global finance and economic issues. Uh, he, has an, he has had an illustrious career where he has served multiple financial regulatory organizations globally, including Benegara Malaysia, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong, the, and the uh, World Bank, to name a few. Currently, he is a distinguished fellow uh, at the Asia Global Institute in the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he also writes regularly for leading publications and has also published several books on monetary, economics and financial issues. Uh, and I think just as a fun tidbit, he has also been featured in uh, an Oscar winning documentary, which I think many of us would know, uh, which is the uh, Inside Job. Uh, so yeah, so I think let's not waste any more time and I'm sure you would rather listen to uh, Tanshi than to me. Uh, with that, Tanshi, I invite you to uh, kick off your presentation. Uh, thank you. Selamat uh, petang, selamat sejahtera. Lindung diri. Okay, uh, you know, you um, asked me to uh, talk about US-China uh, uh, relations and its impact on Malaysia. So I did a presentation um, that will give a very quick overview that gives us uh, sufficient time uh, to have about 45 minutes of uh, Q&A. Uh, let me very quickly get to the share screen. Uh, here we are, I think. Good. OK, so ini perang gajah, OK? And, um, and uh, my view of uh, for Malaysia is that we have to be sang kanjil. We have to be smart in how to deal with perang uh, gajah. OK, um, very quickly. Uh, the talk is uh, roughly 40 minutes uh, with lots of slides, so you can, uh, I've sent the uh, PDF version to your colleagues and you can distribute it if you want. Uh, but I intend to very quickly run through this. It's going to be five parts. Uh, uh, first part on the big picture, uh, why uh, the US-China relationships is very complicated. And um, as uh, I think Malaysia's stance is the correct one, we don't want to choose sides. Uh, and that's essentially the stance of ASEAN. Second one, uh, why uh, Asia will still be the very important uh, growth zone for the world. Um, uh, and, uh, but you know, if we get caught in the US-China um, uh, Cold War uh, 2.0, uh, we could be balkanized. 
And number three, uh, why ASEAN is extremely important and why strengthening Malaysia within ASEAN itself is even more important. Uh, I totally understand why we need to have our internal disagreements, but if we're not careful, the rest of ASEAN will overtake us uh, and we really need to be aware of this. Um, then the fourth one uh, is about the business model for Malaysia. Uh, there is a book uh, by a former McKinsey uh, on uh, the origins of wealth. And origins of wealth, he talks about physical technology, uh, social technology, and then business models. Uh, and uh, I'll explain this later, but essentially business model is very, very critical. And finally, uh, why Malaysia should concentrate on its social technology, which I think is Malaysia's diversity and strength. So very quickly, uh, part one on the mega trends. Now, the, uh, this is way back um, in the 2004, 2005, uh, Cambridge University, Club of Rome, projections had already shown that the uh, US uh, probably peaked around uh, early 2012, 2013, and then started, you know, sliding. Uh, and China uh, is, 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 is growing, particularly on purchasing power. Now, purchasing power is not as, as, as important uh, as uh, exchange rate uh, by market uh, interest rates. But a lot of people talk about purchasing power par parity because it's, it's the buying power domestically. So in Malaysia, the ringgit buying power is quite strong. Uh, and, and so our purchasing power parity is higher than our exchange rate uh, valuation, uh, particularly relative to GDP. Um, the, the, uh, the, the issue, uh, 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 if you were to read Ray Dalio, who is one of the top uh, world um, uh, um, asset managers, um, is that um, the uh, um, America, this blue line, Okay, if you really look at back in history, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, uh, back in uh, uh, and China is the red line, and then India, let me see, where is India? India is this green line. Uh, India and China, the two of them, uh, because of population, basically accounted for half of world GDP all the way uh, up to around 1500. And then, of course, as you know, um, uh, Christopher Columbus discovered America. Europe started conquering Americas, got a lot of wealth. And with that wealth, uh, started slavery in, uh, in Africa uh, and then uh, started colonization, uh, conquered India. Uh, India then started going downhill. You can see this green line. And then China uh, at 1700 uh, peaked, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 around you know, 1600. And then started, you know, sliding after 1800, and didn't stop until 1950. Now, at 1950, the per capita income in China was lower than per capita of India. Now, just to give you a, a, a relativity standing, India and China was roughly 25 percent of GDP each around the 1500 levels. Uh, after the British took over India. Uh, the, the, uh, at that time, India's uh, G GDP, uh, if you use this particular line, um, uh, would have been around 15% of world GDP. Um, and then it dropped to 4% of GDP by the time uh, the British left. And so uh, uh, post-independence uh, uh, or the uh, Chinese uh, Revolution, uh, 1949, the, the, the PRC, the red line is China and the green line is India. Okay, so India and China is actually, India's grown and India's today, today's the, uh, up to 2019 was the fastest growing economy. Uh, now, the wealth issue is even more interesting. If you look at the global wealth report, China's net wealth, net assets is now 80% of the United States. Okay, and this is actual US dollars. GDP is already 65%. In fact, because the U.S. declined by 3.4% last year, 2020, and China was about 2% up, the, the China is around 72% of U.S. GDP already. And as the exchange rate also strengthens, uh, this is you know, pretty serious. 
The interesting factor is that if you look at G8 now, that means you know it's China is not really part of G7. But if you look at G7, okay, uh, and plus China, they account for 83 percent of world net assets. Uh, that's net of liabilities, by the way. And then the um, the GDP is around 60 percent. Okay, and, and you have not added uh, you know other countries like ASEAN, uh, you know, etc. So these numbers are particularly interesting. Um, the problem today, uh, if I may put it very, very simply, is that America believes in absolute freedom. The, Chi the Chinese believe in everything is relative. Um, the, uh, and then the approach is very zero sum. It's either my way or no way, you know, uh, and it's all about me, me. Individualism is very critical in America, and which, is, which is the major problem with the masks uh, and the vaccination uh, issue. The China, China is much more we, we, right? The collective is much more important for the individual. And in Asia, it's we, me. You know, uh, me is important, but it's the collective before the individual. Uh, whereas, you know, the, 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 the Europe, for example, uh, is more uh, me, we, you know, uh, EU style. Me is important, but, you know, we is also very important. Now, the point about transitions is that you know, life is all about transitions. You know, you move from youth to middle age to retirement age. Uh, your economy moves from emerging market to uh, either a submerging market or a rich economy. But to be able to, to succeed, you need to emerge, you need to experiment, you need to have diffusion of the technology, you need to coordinate it, you need to refinger, uh, re reconfigure, you need to contract out uh, to everybody. And in this sense, the Western, you know, study of systems change is now very similar to the uh, Chinese one, which is no theory, total learning by experience, okay, but extremely practical uh, on, on how to deal with change. So um, if we look at transitions, uh, you, a lot of you who are engineers wouldn't understand the S-curve. You start off very slowly, then you have a phase of acceleration, and then when you mature, you slow down, and then if you if, if you decay, you actually go down. But uh, the 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 secret is to go to scale. And the big problem with all emerging markets is the middle income trap. Now China is about to break through, and China has one big secret, which a lot of people don't understand. Uh, there was a very famous um, a big tech guy, either Alibaba or Tencent. Uh, who basically was talking to the Western guys about why did China succeed? And he said, you don't get it. It's all about speed, scale, and scope. You know, the Chinese speed to market is very fast, all right? For 1.4 billion people, you know, 40 years to move up from very poor country to number two in the world is amazing by historical standards. Number two, the scale is 1.4 billion people. I, I always say there are three 1.4 billions in the world. You know, there's Chinese 1.4, there's 1.4 Indians. India is about 10 to 15 years behind China. And then behind India is actually the Islamic population all the way from Indonesia to the Middle East. And uh, if, if the Islamic population can get its act together, uh, which is not easy because of very diverse uh, backgrounds and stages of development, um, in terms of moving up to middle, middle income, it's only another probably 10 years behind uh, uh, India. So within the next two, two to three decades, there is about nearly four billion people, half of the world's population, moving up to middle class. What is the implication? The rich West is going to be marginalized. Okay, so it's uh, it's not as if it's uh, uh, ordained or it's certain, but it it you know the the West is beginning to to feel threatened. Put it this way. Okay. So, you know, essentially the rich West is roughly 1 billion people, you know, ruling the rest of the uh, uh, 6.8 of the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, with the rise of China and followed by, let's say, India, the non-white population is telling the white population, you know, we don't necessarily agree with everything you say. You know, you've been uh, leaders of the world, but, you know, uh, now, nowadays, you know, people can talk to each other as equals. This is a very fundamental change, right? Now, uh, uh, very quickly coming down to the BIS um, 
uh, uh, latest uh, global situation. We had a pandemic. It was a casual recovery with US and China uh, 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 leading it. Uh, it was a deeper, re deep recession, originally thought for the world to be down minus 5%. Uh, later on, it's uh, adjusted back to around minus three, three and a half. Uh, and then the recovery was much stronger than expected. So now let me very quickly, you know, uh, wh say why Asia, I think, is, uh, is the preferred investment zone. Now, the Asia is just in 2019, before the pandemic, China plus India plus Korea plus ASEAN accounted for more than half, in fact, 70% of uh, global growth. Okay? So, you know, if they want to mess up the world, mess up Asia. If Asia itself messes it itself up, you know, it's going to be a serious problem. So the West has a love-hate relationship with Asia. You know, you love because, you know, it's the, it's the future of the growth market. You hate it because you're going to challenge the West, right? This is a very fundamental issue. But China, India plus ASEAN is the heart of the global value chain. Okay, and it's due to favorable dem demographics and it's moving very rapidly into middle income because of technology. All right. South, South America is very important. Africa is very important in terms of population, but they can't seem to get their act together. Okay, middle, middle East is endowed with a lot of oil resources, but again has a lot of problems because of geopolitical interference, you know, as we all know. Uh, uh, and also the internal problems. So ASEAN is very much in a sweet spot, okay? Uh, everybody needs ASEAN, uh, and I'll explain later why. So competition between China and Japan to fund infrastructure in, in the region is great for uh, ASEAN. I'll give you examples later. Now, the, the reason why everybody's invested in the US is because US ROE, the return on equity, is outperformed. This is a chart by the Norway Fund since 1998. And if you look at that uh, 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 American line, it's, you know, particularly since 2012, it's bounced way ahead. You know, previously it used to be kind of slightly better, but tracking, okay? The blue line is Asia Pacific. And Asia Pacific wasn't doing badly. Uh, and then the dark blue line is Europe, which always been a laggard. Today, if you really look at, look at it very carefully, you know, Asia Pacific and Europe is actually tracking each other and the Americans are powered ahead. And the power ahead is mainly due to the fangs, the big, the big tech, okay? And Americans borrow the rest of the world's money at nearly zero to 1% interest rate per year, okay? Borrow it and then reinvest back through uh, the Intels, the Motorola's, you know, uh, et cetera. They come in and reinvest back in Asia and uh, Europe earning an ROE anywhere between 20 to 25%. So American companies have been very good in their business model, superior to the Japanese, to the Europeans, and to the Chinese. But the Chinese have now grown in scale. So, um, uh, okay, so now the next one, you know, the, the global growth was driven by demographics and higher savings rate, okay? And all these are the population, uh, India and uh, uh, ASEAN, very young population, North Asia, Japan, China, uh, South Korea, uh, including Taiwan, you know, uh, 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 aging, aging extremely fast. OK, uh, and, and but the export side, look at what's happened with the export side. You know, China, India are or as percentage of GDP about the same. Sorry, did, did somebody want to ask a question? No. OK, um, very quickly, let me run through this. Now, McKinsey has got, you know, estimates that if the Chinese were to engage with the rest of the world, there to 2040, there will be 22 to 35 trillion dollars of gain. Now, how much is 22 to 35 trillion dollars worth of gains? World GDP is roughly 88 to 90 trillion dollars. Okay, so you're talking about one quarter uh, uh, world GDP productivity gains if you actually use technology, and that's only China. You know, so what about India? What about ASEAN? How do we get our act together? That's the real uh, issue. So to a large extent, the trade war is already shifting business towards regional trading, okay? A lot of people don't know this. I mean, people always thought, oh, America's biggest trading partner is Europe, 
uh, or, 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 or China. No. Last year, America's largest trading partner was, was with ASEAN. Uh, Germany's largest trading partner last year was, was with China. You know, ASEAN was uh, uh, China's third largest trading partner. Okay. And, and Ray Dalio comes in and does an analysis why China has overtaken the US in many ways. Just look at how many US and Chinese nationals studying in China and the United States uh, between 1997 to 2008. More than just under 350,000 Chinese students are studying in the United States, United States studying in China, almost, you know, zilch. Okay. There are only, uh, you know, this is a statistic. I don't know how true this is. There are only 300 experts on China from the United States. I mean, you know, with, within the universities. It's a very small group, all right, who, who, who study China. And so they don't understand the Chinese. More Chinese, you know, went to the United States. Uh, President Xi Jinping's daughter, for example, uh, studied at Harvard, okay? Uh, 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 you know, so a, a lot of the Chinese uh, um, uh, leaders have their children or they themselves have studied, uh, uh, you know, in American or, or British universities, etc. Whereas Americans have basically been very, very isolated. But look at the STEM numbers. The two largest countries with STEM education is India and China. Okay, in the engineering faculties in the United States, you, those of you who've been there would know this. The the indigenous, no, I, I won't use the word indigenous. The white American people in the engineering faculties in America is now a minor minority. Most of the uh, people who are, who are studying engineering in America are today Chinese, Indians, uh, East Asians, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Central, Central Asians, uh, you know, uh, sorry, um, Central Europeans, including um, uh, uh, Russian uh, European background. So yeah, America is feeling very threatened in this. Okay. Now let's look at financial markets. This is, a, this is a number that shows that by 2035, APEC could reach half of world capital, capital market size. Okay. But at the present market is very fragmented. And uh, if, if you look at the depth of the market, the IPO, uh, this is ASIFMA, you know, uh, 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 Asian uh, 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 of, you know, uh, Institute of uh, Fund Managers. Um, uh, basically, uh, APEC, you know, uh, value as percent of GDP is already highest, uh, and, and American market, American investors, uh, w and you know, remember this: China is not fully uh, 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 factored in MSCI uh, for for relative to GDP investment uh, and stock market uh, size. And once uh, you know, China and India and ASEAN uh, becomes much more important in MSCI, the markets will take off. Now, today, uh, nine out of 27 Forbes Global 500 uh, companies are Chinese, uh, and 91 out of 124 Chinese firms are already in the Forbes uh, 500. So today, the Forbes uh, Global 500 no longer is American or European or Japanese dominated. The Chinese have come in big. Uh, very soon, ASEAN, and uh, in my view, ASEAN, uh, South Korean, uh, 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 et cetera, companies will join the Forbes 500. So the U.S. dilemma is, do they copy the Chinese uh, to beat the Chinese? And this is uh, uh, Jude Blanchett. You know, we can read his latest article in Foreign Affairs. You know, there is no long-term strategy for successfully competing against Chinese state capitalism that does not include significant investment in domestic infrastructure, education system, healthcare, governance per capacity. That's the heart of the issue, okay? Uh, the Americans are feeling extremely insecure. It's not that America is not strong. America is very strong, okay? It has a military capacity four times uh, the uh, larger than next uh, competitor, okay? And uh, next five uh, governments add, added together is not equal to the spending of America in military side. So America is very strong there very strong in education, science and technology, et cetera, but there are weaknesses coming up. So now let's, 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 let's move very quickly to ASEAN. Okay, uh, uh, why ASEAN is very important. Look at ASEAN. In, in PPP terms, 
By 2030, ASEAN PPP GDP will be 14.5 trillion, you know, uh, behind uh, China, America, Europe, and India. Okay, right? Uh, uh, but three times larger, or nearly three, nearly three times Japan's. In market terms, it will be 6.7 trillion. Okay, that's bigger than Japan today. All right. So it's, 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 it's going to be the fourth largest economy by 2030. A lot of people don't realize this, okay? ASEAN is growing at 5% per year, faster than the rest of the world, right? Faster than the rest of the world. And its population will, you know, will be 700 billion, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, um, um, and even today, the GDP of ASEAN is $2.5 trillion, equivalent to Germany. So ASEAN is very powerful, okay? And a lot of people don't get this, right? Forget, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, I'm, you know, I don't mean to be impolite. You know, uh, uh, Latin America market important, Africa import, ma important market, but the real growth in terms of natural resources, young population, access to technology, good education is ASEAN. Uh, and that's why I'm very, 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 very um, positive about the region, right? The uh, ASEAN digital consumer is driving innovation. It's got disposable income, longer life expectancy, and one in two living in cities. Okay, and the uh, urbanization and demographics are driving it. Okay, and you know these things you know very much. You you can study in this detail. But look at this chart, right? By 2030, ASEAN will be fourth behind China, US, and India. This is the number that we got. Okay, India is 19.4. This is PPP terms. Indonesia alone is 6.1. Bigger than, by that time, Indonesia as big as Japan, okay, bigger than Russia, you know, and uh, uh, double the size of South Korea. But this is in PPP terms. But if you then look at the comparison, Vietnam with 100 million population growing at more than 5%. Thailand, you know, is significantly larger than us population, 1.8. Philippines, 1.7. Philippines, another 100 million. Malaysia is already behind Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and Philippines, okay? Singapore is very powerful because of the financial center. It is, uh, the GDP will not be as great, but Myanmar is ca catching up uh, and the others are much, much smaller. But in total, this is where. And by that time, Malaysia's PPP is equal to that of Australia. We used to think Australia very, very rich, very powerful, you know, better education, et cetera, et cetera. If we get our act together, we can be better. So. You know, the reforms in uh, Chinese, Indian, and ASEAN equity markets, this is a study by OECD, Capgemini, and KPMG, you know, this will disrupt the whole world's uh, financial markets, including fintech uh, uh, adaptation. Okay, very quickly now, how do we get there? Well, we know innovation is the future of any country, but Malaysia is extremely lucky. You know, we 50% of our exports is, 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 is uh, engineering and electric electrical uh, products, right? And we have huge MNCs, you know, like Dell, Intel, Broadcom, Hatalega, Inari, you know, uh, uh, you name it, contributing to Malaysian exports, uh, including rubber gloves, uh, et cetera. They've, you know, led our Bursa re revival. This Bursa revival, the stock market revival was nothing due to, due to our palm oil, due to our uh, oil and gas, you know, due to our timber, due to real estate, it was all driven by technology, right? And a lot of this will do, do depend upon ESG, okay? How do we move on to ESG? Uh, and how do we uh, improve on the local innovation? How do we build on this? Okay, now ESG is very important because the foreign companies inside Malaysia now, who are already in Malaysia, they will be moving towards ESG, which means that they will be willing to engage with Malaysian uh, 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 NGOs, civil society, to try and help uh, SMEs, you know, or, or communities, okay? So it is really about globalization. It's not just about globalization. Globalization used to be thought of, you know, the global companies coming here, extract everything and take everything out. Today, everything is about how do we take global ideas, localize it, and uh, create the innovation and then these local innovations become global, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, I Indonesia is already there with Gojek and uh, Tokopedia. Uh, they are the largest um, uh, uh, tech platform outside, outside US, China, 
and maybe Flipkart in India. Okay, so to a large extent, Malaysia, uh, you know, has got Grab. Uh, you know, uh, uh, well, now now it's a Singapore listed company, but you know, many issues is how do we get our act together and 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 move forward. And this requires exactly what the pandemic has told us: we need uh, a whole of government, whole of society to work together. And our difficulty is how come we're not working together? And that's the real challenge, right? So the 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 the, the, the next issue is it is a mindset change, right? Malaysia is not short of entrepreneurial talent, right? We, we, we have a lot of talented people. Uh, our professionals are world-class, okay? Uh, uh, we can be very proud of our, our, our youth, okay? Uh, uh, and, you know, they are, you know, making waves all over the world, you know, including in Malaysia, right? But we lack an ecosystem of how to help SMEs, on a whole range of skills, branding, strategy, technology, finance, product service differentiation, HR and reskilling. Okay. This is not about theory. You know, forget about theory. You know, we learn from the West. And I'm sorry to say this is colonial uh, uh, data colonization. Okay. Uh, free market. You know, uh, uh, you know uh, we, we got to copy the best practice. Okay. We really need to be practical over this. If it doesn't fit our local conditions, it's not about best practice. It's about best fit. What best fit our situation? Now, you know, if you really look at it, what's, what is happening now is that the linear education is completely out, right? We have a, a, a situation whereby school children go in, go through a linear step-by-step, -step, you know, uh, five years uh, primary school, uh, uh, five years secondary school, uh, six years secondary school, you know, three or four years university come out waiting, you know, uh, to find a job. And then the employers complain they are not getting the graduates they want. And so the linear is, is, is all out. It's no longer about IQ. It's about EQ and how we sell. Okay. So it's an open talent economy, right? And we have the diversity. We have the gender. We have the race. You know, we have open talent. Uh, how do we get there? Okay. So that's the last question that I, I really want to pose. Actually, Malaysia's, you know, cannot compete on physical technology because we're a small economy. But our because of our cultural diversity, our social technology is actually very good. Okay, if we get our act together, and uh, 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 and you know the business models today we can borrow, right? So it really is about ABC, you know, academia working together uh, to with business. You know, to reskill. This is where the reskilling of our population is not about reskilling uh, uh, training of our young. We have, you know, 90% of our present workers need to be reskilled, okay, reskilled onto the new, new, new ideas. And we also need to reskill the civil service, okay. How does the civil service work on A, you know, academia, B, business, C, civil service, civil society? Okay, to, to, to in the new uh, post-COVID uh, economy, this is a collective action that we need to sort out. But to do this, I'm sorry, you know, the old model is broken. We know it's broken, right? The question is, uh, what we now need is a new social consensus. How do we have this conversation to be able to work together rather than first thing today is about, you know, about uh, uh, race, religion, et cetera, et cetera. Rather, how do we prevent our marginalization uh, relative as we see Vietnam, Philippines, you know, uh, Bangladesh, et cetera, et cetera, overtake us, you know, in terms of uh, income per capita and their global influence. Okay. Um, we used to be one of the leaders of ASEAN. Today, we may be in the middle if we don't get our act together, we will be uh, 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 really by bypass. That part is much, much more important than uh, disagreeing internally. All right. So how we use the technology to drive the sense of community, you know, is a very clear uh, difficulty. And, and this is something that we need to begin the conversation. So to conclude, crisis such as the pandemic is an event. They always happen. But reform is a process. There, there is no such thing as no pain, no gain, right? You know, we, we, it is painful. It is very difficult. But we need our diagnosis. 
we need our damage control. We need to share the losses and we need to change the incentives because every time we reform, we get back to square one. That does nothing to us. Okay. And remember this, this Malaysia is not alone in this. You look at what's happening in the United States and the United Kingdom, you know, etc. They're having serious problems. All right. Okay. Every country is in deep trouble. Okay. But we're a small enough country. We have a huge diversity. We've got a very young population. We're very open to ideas. So to a large extent, let's keep an open mind. There is no theory that can teach us what is our niche in the post-pandemic economy. We have to find it ourselves. How do we find it? It's not about the top telling you what to do. It's about young people like the Padano Fellows who have now worked in the government, worked in the private sector, you know, worked in academia, and that's us saying, let's do something very different. How do we do it? That takes teamwork and that takes strategy. That is a process. Let's get out of this post-colonial mindset that the West is best, okay? We, it's not that they are best. If they were best, they would not be in such trouble themselves. So all their theories are obsolete. They have no compass themselves, let alone a moral compass to try and teach us anything. So we need to learn from everybody, be open, be humble, uh, listen more, okay? Be more bottom up rather than top down, globalize. And so let's start this conversation this afternoon this way. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you so, so much, uh, so, Tanshay. I think that yeah, was very yes. uh, engaging. Yeah, so okay. So uh, and from now, we'll start um, the Q&A session uh, or discussion session. Uh, we have about an hour. So um, as I mentioned earlier, for those uh, in the Zoom meeting, if you want to ask questions, you can put it, either put it in the chat or you can raise your hands. Uh, I, I will be moderating the questions. And for those joining us on Facebook, uh, you can leave your questions there as well. Uh, and we will relay that to uh, Dantri. So I think, right, uh, first, just to kick off, I, there's a very interesting question from the crowd at the moment. Uh, I think you've mentioned earlier that uh, the stance that Malaysia and ASEAN is taking right now uh, is a smart one so because we have to be a uh, sankancho, so not choosing sides is, is the optimal choice uh, that uh, that we uh, should take at the moment. Uh, but Suresh Rajopal is uh, asking, do you believe that Malaysia can go on and not take sides indefinitely or will there be a time where we will have to choose? I guess you also mentioned that in 10 years uh, from now, likely you know, the ASEAN economy will be much bigger and we ha will have a bigger sh share of the uh, global economic pie, I guess, and arguably perhaps uh, more bargaining power then. So do you think maybe then perhaps we, uh, we have a bit more power to Two sides? There is only one side to choose, our own side. Okay? Mm. Look at how Indonesia has done it with their high speed rail. They gave one part to the Chinese and the, now the Japanese to the another part. And they get the both of both, both worlds. Both sides will be competing to give Indonesia a very good deal. You see what I'm trying to say? Right? Why should you choose sides? Right? So the, the, the whole point is. The, 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 you know, if America goes for America first, Malaysia could go for Malaysia first, right? And, 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 but Malaysia first means that what we need to do is to get all our population up to wealth, not just a few, if you see what I'm trying to say, right? And that's very, very critical, okay? How do we have this conversation? Previously, we just said, well, there is this great leader, uh, and therefore we listen to him or her, well, that's fine. Today, you know, Frankly speaking, nobody seems to have an answer. So let's sit down together and have a good conversation. You know, you know the, 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 the Malay expression, mashawara, you know, is very critical. Okay, ASEAN may look slow, but we listen. We listen to each other. Your opinion is more important than mine. You know, why, why don't we just talk about it, understand each other, and then find a way forward? Right? We can't solve all the problems uh, in any way. There is no free market, first best solution. You know, uh, all the free market stuff, you know, they get off, you know, you're also free to die, you see? So, you know, we really need to have a better way of doing than before. Yeah, and I think from your presentation earlier, you've highlighted a couple of sort of uh, starting points, like you mentioned, you know, really 
uh, changing that uh, mindset that we have or you know, establishing a new uh, social consensus, right? Um, at, at the moment, from what you're seeing, how likely uh, or how well, I guess, uh, have we started this process? Or uh, uh, do you think, in terms of that, these kind of con conversations that we should have, or do you think that uh, you know definitely there's much more to be done? And you mentioned you know having youth lead this. Um, and I think there's no right way, I guess, for anyone to to start these kind of conversations. Uh, but what do you think we're doing right, uh, and what what can we do? Uh, how can we improve? Well, that? let's look at our leadership. You know, uh, um, most of them are my age. Where are the young? Where is the young? Where are the women amongst this group? You know, mostly men, mostly over over fifty five. Put it this way, okay. And, and, and where are the new ideas, right? Uh, um, uh, so a lot of this is now being, we need to be much, much more open, right? It's, it's no longer uh, anybody having a good advice. You know, uh, uh, we have our, our you know, uh, 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 our very strong professionals. You know, Malaysia did very well during this uh, pandemic, okay? I, I give hats off to the civil service, okay? The security forces. Okay, the health service, particularly the frontline people, they've done very well, but the events are now overwhelming us, and we really need. If if we don't have this conversation now, when are we ever going to have it? That's the point. Okay, so it's the it's the it's the the it's a feedback mechanism, right? A, you know, it's a feed that you know in the old days, you know, oh, yeah, under colonialism. Oh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the British know best. Now, after the British left, you know, maybe the Americans know best. You know, the Americans can't solve their own problems, let alone, you know, anything else, right? So why should, why should you know, we, well, I'm not saying that, you know, the, the Chinese know better, the Indians know better, the Japanese know better. We have to find our own solution. And, but the only way to find that solution is let's sit down and talk. Okay, uh, I see a hand raised. Henry, you have a question? Henry? You might be on mute. Oh, Sorry, I, yeah, I've just been uh, unmuted. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for your uh, interesting uh, sharing. Um, so I think the concern here uh, isn't that the Americans are the perfect ones, right? Because um, I think everyone knows about you know their their issues of slavery back in the you know uh, long time ago and all that kind of stuff. Um, but talking about China, you talked about you know the win-win kind of uh, attitude that Asia has. Um, but how? But looking at the facts on the ground, like for example, when China has that nine dash line claim over South China Sea. How do you reconcile that uh, that fact? Yeah. When they're Don't care about the one dash line. Don't care about it. Who gave the Americans Diego uh, uh, Garcia? Who gave Bikini Island to the French? Who took Malaysia? Come on. This was, you know, they just came in, they took it. Okay. So, you know, we, we have now border problems. The big problems of Africa are in the Middle East are all due to the colonials in the 19th century. You know, the famous lines that were drawn to a straight line across, right? You know, which bear no resemblance to geography. Okay? If we have border problems, let's sit down and talk with them. Let's, 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 let's just discuss this. This is a very good time to discuss with the Chinese or anybody, right? I mean, you know, who gave the, the, the right for the West to, 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 to wipe out a lot of American Indians in America, okay? And then enslave Africans, to, you know, so that they have a racial problem in America today? Who gave them the right? You know, who gave them that border? Was it God? Okay, so you must understand this nine dash line lines or whatever is not as important as how we live with each other. And at this particular time, when China needs ASEAN, China needs America, uh, 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 you know, Malaysia. Okay, it's a good time to talk. 
You think we have enough um, aircraft carriers to fight Americans and the, 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 the Chinese? You know, let me, let me give you a simple illustration. Go to the Australian website, johnmenadu.com. The Australians sell the biggest customer is iron and coal to China. And then they invested in submarines. The original budget was $80, $50 billion. It's now gone up to $150 billion submarines they bought from Germany to fight China. They, the submarines will only be delivered in, 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 in 2040, by which time they will be obsolete. Is this smart thinking? You know, right? So the, the, they, they have bought uh, uh, American Abrams tanks. According to an Australian website, 60% of the bridges in North, North Australia cannot take these tanks. Are they the most clever people about what is happening? It goes to show the incompetence, you know, in many so-called civil service or defense regimes that one used to admire, all right? So to a large extent, think for yourself. Don't just read something from the New York Times, you know, or the Times of London and said, this is true. A lot of this now, I'm sorry to say this, you know, we are having a real hard time deciding which is right, which is wrong. So think for yourself, you know, I mean, you know, if you are on the front lines of an SME struggling to eat, you go and talk to him about nine dash line, he'll tell you, go to hell. Take care of my food first. Take care of my health first. Don't talk to me about fighting, you know, right? So to a large extent, we really need to get our own priorities right. Okay, I admire you. you, you want to study this, this is very interesting. But what is happening to our own population? Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, just a follow up. Then are you saying that, um, uh, well, because China has, has taken care of its backyard, now they can extend at 9-9, and then we shouldn't fight, uh, fight for our sovereignty? Of course we look after our interest. But how do you fight 1.4 billion people? How do you fight? Henry, you know, can we appoint you general in charge of us to fight 1.4 billion people? We've now probably, you know, as sophisticated weapons as anybody else. This is a matter of negotiation. Border disputes are a matter of national negotiation. Why is Malaysia so important to China? In 1974, Tun Razak was the first of the ASEAN countries to reopen diplomatic relations with China. Okay? The Chinese value Malaysia. So if there are issues there, let's talk. How do you, how do a Sang Kanchil negotiate with a Gajah? Um, yeah. With brains, with brains. And, you cannot be yeah. powerful than them. Okay? Uh, yeah, thanks. I think that, that, that there is an interesting point that you made that because we're small, we, uh, we're, we, we can't uh, fight. I think we're not talking about a war here. Um, but I think what is interesting is that I think you might mention about how Europeans had their colonialism, uh, you know, a century ago, right? Mm. But I think that's what led to the First and Second World War. And that's why after that, uh, in the Second World War, uh, they came together, they, they instituted the United Nations and, uh, you know, some international laws to, to essentially uh, gu guide everyone's uh, actions, right? So that's why uh, the Europeans have to let, let me go explain their... this. Let me explain this. Yeah, can I just finish? Let's, yeah. Can I just, just, when you talk about international law, has the Americans signed UNICLOS? Uh, I, th I don't think so. Exactly. Yeah. They but, don't, that the law is one law for you and one law for me. Yeah, but the thing yeah. is, yeah, I think for a long time, uh, since, uh, the, since after the Second World War, I think for, for at least for a time being, 
until up until now. I think no major countries have uh, attempted to like take other countries by force, right? That's because I think, uh, although imperfect, but there is a, a global understanding, right? That there shouldn't be uh, any taking of new territories and all that, right? And that's partly because uh, US has the, the largest uh, military force, the largest economy, and and they have uh, prevented uh, people seizing territories, right? So I guess, like, if you if you talk about just because you're big, you wanna you can now draw a line in in the South China Sea. I don't think that's that's rational, right? So I don't think that's win win for anyone. Yeah. So that's win- yeah. I- Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. I think what 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 the conversation is getting at is probably you know that, that there has been such uh, there's so there's already established sort of processes in the world when it comes to trying to negotiate political borderlines or, or even political negotiations, and it is challenging for Malaysia as a small country to be able to have some bargaining power in in these kind of conversations. But that, that, that's definitely one of the problems, as you mentioned, that you know we there's no really uh, an easy solution out of it. Um, is I think how we can wrap up and maybe perhaps, you know, uh, we have to be realistic with our expectations uh, when it comes to our ability to negotiate these kind of issues. I think just drawing to one question on uh, in the chat actually about, uh, let me just get uh, the access to the chat. Thank you, Henry, for that uh, question. Uh, there's a question from Lai Yin Yi on, uh, you know, how initially there was an expectation for Biden perhaps to uh, undo what, uh, what Trump's policy. Uh, and you once emphasized that uh, if Biden begins his term by choosing division over dialogue, changing course with China will soon become difficult, if not impossible. Uh, given that uh, it's clear that uh, Biden wants to continue China's um, uh, uh, their, or Trump's policy or Trumpian policy towards China, do you think there's any chance of a U-turn for uh, the US or you know, is, is there even an appetite? Is it even possible at this point? Um, the United States problems is not with China. The United States problem is internal. You know, uh, you know, the reason why the Europeans have difficulty dealing with Europe, uh, dealing with America, including Biden, is that they do not know if Biden uh, can easily lose his majority in the Senate, uh, which is a very thin majority, and maybe even the uh, um, <clears throat> maybe even the um, uh, uh, Congress majority of fourteen. Okay, by 2022 elections. If that were to happen, and if you look at the foreign policy stance of the uh, Republicans, uh, back to not exact Trumpism, um, the, uh, uh, Europe would, and the rest of the world would be very, very worried. So to a large extent, we are no longer dealing with a uh, consistent policy that may be applied very rationally today. Okay, the very fact that forty percent of American population, uh, well, maybe not exactly that number, uh, uh, do not want to wear masks, uh, do not want to uh, take vaccinations, uh, uh, deny that January six was not a riot when it happened right in front of our eyes, right? Um, the uh, is is real serious worry. Okay, so um, so to a large extent, we are in a in a phase of the world in which we can no longer rely on the dominant military power to exercise rational judgment. Let me put it this way. Okay, it's not that they do not want to be rational. It is that the emotional part is now driving the conversation there. And therefore, what is most worrying between US-China relationship is accidents. That means, you know, if you have an accident happening for whatever reason, uh, it will be very, very problematic. Okay. Uh, the, 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 this is something that nobody can control. And that's why Angela Merkel's uh, who was a quantum chemist, uh, said very beautifully, uh, in this quantum age, everything is possible, everything is possible, and take nothing for granted. 
Okay, and that's why self-strengthening is so much more important. It's you know, it's nobody will take care of us except ourselves. Let's be very realistic about this. Okay, we have to be stronger. We have to be smarter. We have to be you know uh, uh, do it in a way which will benefit not just us but future generations. I think yeah. Um, so uh, before I, I'll go to Rabin, I think I think uh, like uh, Yingyi's question, uh, other question actually is quite uh, related to what you just said. You you talked about how part of why Biden has perhaps decided to pursue this line of uh, foreign policy is because of the internal uh, turmoil that U.S. has its uh, within its own sort of uh, political model or a democratic model. Um, so the question here is. Um, yeah. So, do you think uh, that you know if China's whole process, people's democracy, uh, or perhaps uh, other different systems uh, uh, in terms of democracy, could be uh, serve as a better model uh, to democracy? You know, I I think it's very difficult to be judgmental on which is better. Okay. Uh, there was a Singaporean senator, uh, senator now in uh, in Canada who made a very interesting talk about US-China relationships from a Canadian perspective. And he said there are two types of democracies, input democracy and output democracy. What he meant was input democracy means that as long as you have freedom, you have the rule of law, you have democracy, you'll be fine. But what's the outcome? The outcome is that you know, the poor are getting poorer, uh, the rich are getting richer, you know, the, 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 the poor doesn't have jobs or decent jobs, Right, the education between the poor and the rich is huge. The rich wants to go up to space, and they don't care what's happening to the many people who are sleepless, living in you know in the cities. We see it for ourselves, right? And you call this democracy? The output democracy is well, maybe you know it doesn't look as if democracy from the West, but at least it delivered uh, 700 million people out of poverty. Okay, and, and India has a democracy, uh, but the Westerners now say Indian democracy is flawed, you know, right? Okay, so the, 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 the issue is, um, is, is Singapore a democracy? Singapore is, you know, elections, but, you know, it has its own form of democracy, right? So to a large extent, uh, uh, let's not label. Let's look at the outcome, right? It's an output that matters. Do they deliver or they don't deliver? How many times have we seen politicians just before the election says, you know, I promise you this, I promise you that, I promise this, when they, go, they get re-elected, nothing happens. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the result is, let's try and be much more practical and be much more results-oriented. Slogans don't get us anywhere. All right? Okay? It really is all about what we do to make our lives better, okay? And how is that better? Well, it's a matter of judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's that's actually quite well said. I think we also have um, not just the democracy model, but also sort of what economic approaches or economic models. You know, some people argue the reason why the U.S. democracy fails because how uh, how active capitalism is is uh, how capitalism is practiced in the U.S., for example. Uh, I'll, I think I'd like to bring uh, Rabin uh, for for him to ask this question. Sure. Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Tansri. Privileged to talk to you. Um, so I guess my question is more about, um, you know, uh, about you know, something slightly different. It's about, you know, adapting the business models, with the Malaysian economy to the new economy. Or, you know, you mentioned a point on ESG. So I guess my question is, it seems like, you know, big, a lot of business structures in Malaysia, whether it's in the plantation sector, the glove sector, the auto sector, is sort of based around you could say exploiting foreign labor, you know, or non-ESG things. So how, you know, if we were to do take ESG seriously, adapt all these businesses, I mean, we will cause some kind of conflict, you know, in the whole structure of the Malaysian economy. So how do you, have you thought about how that will play out, how it will look and what it will do to the economy in the short term? Well, you see, if, if you know, from it, I'm talking pure economics now, not politics, okay? The pure economics issue is that how do you break out of the middle income trap is a matter of labor productivity. How can you have labor productivity when you underpay your own youth? And why is our youth having such low pay? 
because we are able to employ a foreigner at you know uh, you know maybe not quite uh, 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 half of the gaji that you're supposed to play a, a local. Okay, so the result is the 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 and and then now you find what's the big problem with the uh, uh, foreign labor? Uh, the, the foreign labor is number one is mistreated because they live in very crowded uh, environment. They probably don't get vaccination, you know, uh, uh, etc. And they're exposed. And once they're exposed, they expose everybody else, right? So to a large extent, if we spend so much money protecting our people, why don't we spend more money? Giving them better reskilling grants, subsidies to do the job that it should be done by our own people, rather than hiring somebody from abroad. Okay, right. So the 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 issue is, if you really want to educate your people, why are you spending your your your, your scarce resources educating foreign labor when you should be educating your own people? It doesn't make sense, right? And hiring the foreign labor cuts your own your your own people's gaji. It doesn't make sense, you know. And then, of course, you people tend to forget this: that when you hire the foreign labor, what happens to their demand for healthcare? Okay, right? They are also having the same. They are human beings. They need the same demand for healthcare. They they can't get the same housing, right? And if they if they demand the same quality housing, why aren't we giving better housing to our own people? I mean, it, you know, this is it. It's pure logic, right? It's pure logic. So, to a large extent, the whole idea of you know using foreign labor is a shortcut. It's so much tougher to redesign the curricula, to work with the business sector, to train our people with the curricula. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that the civil service is not very good. It is very good, but how much do the civil service design the curricula to what the employers want? You see, the peep that the curricula, you know, is really designed by the employers. Here's the statistics I learned. Right, forty percent of the 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 intake in Silicon Valley today did not graduate. Not that they could not graduate. The employer said, "I don't need a a a, a PhD or 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 even a, a first degree. All I need to know is." What did you do in your project? Who is your 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 professor? You know, and you tell them I worked on robotics. Uh, I worked on the uh, creative design. Ah, and then they tell you uh, the question is not what you succeed. Where did you fail? Why did you fail? And you tell them, well, you know, I didn't design this properly. You know, they are hiring people on the skills that is not about a degree. Okay. So you know, let's look at what's happened in Malaysia. I'm sorry to say this: if you have a degree from a top-notch university, you have a better chance of getting a job than a local. Kenapa? Okay, and it's you know the real reason is that actually the foreign university is teaching the the, the students more how to cope with a new digital economy issues than our local universities. Then. This issue is not about sending more of a few people to top universities. The question is, how do we change our teachers, work with the business sector, okay, and actually re-adapt the education system to produce graduates that the business wants? All right. So it's a very new way of looking at things. What I'm trying to say here is this: when the best is no longer the best. The West is no longer the best. The rest need to think for themselves. Don't just say just because the New York Times says this, just because the Times of London says this. Oh, it must be very good. Okay, right? It's wrong. Think for yourself. Think for yourself, because in this post-COVID world, nobody will look after you except yourself. Okay, you think you know the Americans will help you? You think you know the foreigners will help you? Forget it. Okay, they help you because they want something from you, right? So what we now really need to do is to work together as Malaysians to help ourselves take us to the next level, and it's completely possible, by the way.
Yeah. I, just to pick on one of the things you said, you mentioned about how, I think you mentioned this in your presentation as well, about how a lot of this change needs to be uh, driven by the private sectors, right? Like, for example, when you're talking about how a Silicon Valley doesn't really put any priority on education because they're able to perhaps better equip uh, and better identify what kind of skills um, that uh, need to employ. I think one issue Malaysia has always had is that uh, perhaps there's a lack of incentive for the private uh, uh, institutions or for private companies to to make these kind of changes, right? Because they are currently able to uh, make large profits off of these uh, large margin that they uh, that they make because they're, they're charging very, uh, you know, pennies for labors. Uh, like you mentioned, you know, by using foreign labors, they can get cheaper labor and stuff like that. What, how do you think these incentives, or what kind of incentives can we create or what incentives, incentives must be there? You know, should government play a role in trying to provide those kind of incentives to sort of nudge the private sector to, to um, start making these kind of changes? Do you know who is the biggest investor in ASEAN? Malaysians. You go and look at the plant, oil palm plantations, etc. in Indonesia. You know, you look at the, the, the investments in Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos. You know, Malaysians. Why are they investing there? Because, you know, they say, say well, the, you know, the, 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 the business environment is more business friendly, put it this way. So we really need to rethink, you know, it's not about, you know, you know why do banks why are banks suffering compared to the new uh, platform services that are coming? You know, uh, why is it so easy touch and go uh, is doing better than, let's say, you know, normal banking, right? The reason is they are coming to you rather than a, like a bank, expect the customer to go to the bank. It's a complete change of mind mindset. Malaysians now need no longer can say, oh, I'm a civil servant. I expect you to come to me. You know, you should now go to the business and the same thing with the business. We should all work together. But, you know, it comes down to a, a different mindset. Okay. And this is why I say a new conversation needs to begin. It used to happen before, you know, previously in uh, uh, Institute of Strategic and International Studies, ISIS uh, uh, in Kuala Lumpur, under Tan Sri, you know, Nodin Sopi. You know, you know, we used to have, I used to join, then I was in Bank Nagara, we sat down with business community. We listened to them. Civil servants sit there, listen to them. We can talk about anything. It doesn't really matter if we offend each other. But we got down to a national consensus. Today, that conversation is missing. I find it missing. I'm sorry to say this. Okay. Now, it's partly due to the lack of personalities, you know, uh, or platforms, etc. But it's very important that this conversation begins, right? And 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 so you know you know if we come into a meeting and saying that oh you know you want this from me and I want this from you etc cetera, etc cetera, let's let's come in with an open mind let's start you know having a proper conversation what do we want to achieve and very clearly you know I may be wrong as I said Philippines 100 million you know uh, uh, Vietnam is 100 million uh, Indonesia 250 million they are growing at more than five percent. You know, if, 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 if anything, so they will begin to overtake us by sheer size, okay? And so if we don't become more nimble, more flexible, uh, 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 be able to move with a little bit more speed, you know, achieve a little bit of scale, you know, change our different scope, you know, go into green products, etc. you know, we will be able to find our niche. But to find our niche and expect somebody else to do it, it won't happen. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think yeah that I think it's always the who who wants to start the conversation is always the the I mean I, everyone is sort of waiting for other people to to begin those conversations. But you make a point. Someone needs to start it uh, eventually. Uh, only then can we sort of get uh, people to align their objectives and and. Uh, what they need to do. Uh, I'm gonna. The next question I'm gonna pick is from uh, the chat as well. This is from Suresh. Uh, Suresh says uh, that he's worried that the AS that ASEAN will not reach EU's level of unity. Uh, as you mentioned, ASEAN is poised to be the fourth largest economy in the world. What must we do to enhance cohesion among the member states? I guess also maybe perhaps if you want to emulate or how uh, the EU enforces their sort of uh, power as a trading bloc. I think that's something that ASEAN is sort of still sort of missing uh, um, in terms of yeah when it comes to negotiations and and I guess uh, uh, enforcing that power onto other um, 
yeah, and onto the global platform. So, what do you think about that? Well, ASEAN's success has always been variable geometry. You know, it doesn't move as a fixed block. You see, mm -hmm. when you are fixed like EU, you can break. Okay, you know, ASEAN is much more flexible. You know, it's flexible, and its flexibility has been its strength. It's become more resilient, right? It's become much more resilient. And that's why, you know, it, it would get much, much more complicated. If the Americans don't take a hard stand, I want you to take sides. How to take sides, right? You know, if you're willing, if Americans are willing to give us much more, that's fine. No, the Americans are saying, oh, here's what I want you to do, but I'm not going to put any money on the table. Forget it. Okay, forget it, right? You know, we spent in ASEAN how much effort to negotiate the TPP? Guess what? Last minute, boom. Even the Democrats rejected it. Okay? Right? So, you know, the how much can you rely on the Americans now to have a proper conversation? It's not about just ASEAN. Right? The beauty about ASEAN is the ability to adjust to each other. Okay? And we, we all have our own internal problems, right? You know, Myanmar is clearly a major problem. But Myanmar is still a legacy from the British. Okay? So to a large extent, you know, we really now need to have better conversations, you know, not just within ASEAN, but with the borders of ASEAN, like Bangladesh has with Myanmar, etc. Okay? And India, who you know, has uh, some, some involvement. And, and, you know, so to a large extent, is trying to understand each other's side of the story, okay? If you come to negotiation and say, this is what I want, and what you say is irrelevant, you have to listen to me, it's not a dialogue, it's a, it's a monologue, okay? So to a large extent, ASEAN's real strength is to be able to take each other's view and to say, okay, maybe you won't be able to move so fast. Let's wait a little bit. And sometimes, you know, time has a way of solving some of these problems. Or let's take it to the side, okay? The good news is that ASEAN's uh, back channels are actually pretty good, okay? The, 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 the leaders who have worked within ASEAN, you know, not just at the top level, but at the, at, at, at the middle level, at the junior level, has always talked to each other. So, you know, uh, we talk to each other as brothers and sisters, you know, even though we may have our disagreements, but it doesn't really matter. You know, let's, let's, let's slowly move in the right direction. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think one of the advantages for ASEAN has always been that flexibility. And I think at the moment, the appetite is to not really um, have to be a fixed block or, you know, be united in, in opinions and uh, of you know, in terms of how we deal with external people within the ASEAN bloc. Um, yeah, so just to shift uh, gear slightly, uh, uh, you also talked about um, the changes in sort of uh, the financial landscape and how shadow banking has uh, expanded because they're more uh, flexible and they, they are able to anticipate or meet demands better. Um, how do you think Malaysia fares in that landscape, in that changing uh, landscape? I think you also talked a, a little bit about that in uh, one of the writings, uh, one of your writings as well, in terms of this being one of the factors that is disrupting uh, yeah, the financial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the the, the 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 fintechs of this world succeed because the incumbents, the people who actually have the data, don't know how to use it. Right? I mean, who has the biggest data on the customers? The banks. How come the banks don't use the data? You know, and, 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 and you, you, you know full well, right? The, 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 if you go to a bank, they say, Have you, did you bring your IC? You know, uh, did you bring your birth certificate? Or did you bring your, your land title? Okay, how come if, you, the, if the bank is the trusted institution, why can't the bank be the repository of all that information? You have to think about it in a very different way, right? Because nowadays, you know, people, you know, uh, uh, basically want payment. They just, you know, wave your phone and, and that's it. You know, they don't want to even to bring out a credit card anymore, right? Okay. Um, so to a large extent, the, 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 the way we need to get, you know, in, in, into 
our SMEs is how do we help them in a better way? Now, think about it. You know, we, 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 today, you know, uh, uh, Grab has, or, or the, the food deliverers, you know, has created lots of jobs for people with motorbikes, okay? Previously, no, no, no such, no such uh, job has been created. You know, the, 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 the Grab is created. Um, so, you know, technology has enabled this. But how many SMEs, you know, the nasi lemak seller, you know, the, the, the vegetable seller, the fish seller, have their own folks Facebook page? How do we connect them to their customers so that they can get better prices? Okay, right? Nobody helps them. You know, my favorite uh, 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 laksa stall, okay? I asked him, how come you're not in Facebook? He says, every day in the morning, I got to go to the pasar. You know, I got to come back at night. We got time to do, you know, Facebook. You see what I'm trying to say, right? So if, if somebody actually designs for them, a simple Facebook page where you just click order, you know, you, you just tell them very simply, 11.30, please click, click. I will bring my own, you know, barang and to, 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 to collect the food. Everybody will be happier, right? So we have not helped the man in the street. Okay? And during this COVID time, they need the help most. But who's helping them? The answer is, well, there are the chambers of commerce, but they're only for the big companies. You see, who is representing, you know, these small people? Did you know that, you know, that I, you know if, I just want to share with you how uh, stupid I was, put it this way, okay? I was chairman of one of the largest, I mean, the Securities Exchange, I mean, the, the, the Securities Commission, the Hong Kong Securities Futures Commission. Hong Kong is one of the leading stock markets of the world. Okay, right? I never thought one for one moment actually how few companies actually get listed. Do you know in the whole world, there are only 41,000 companies that have listings? And in the United States, the number has gone down from 8,000 to 5,000 something. Instead of actually capital being broad based, it's actually getting more and more concentrated. Okay? So we you know, today, of course, we say, oh, it's crowdfunding. But we really need to think about equity in a very different way. Okay? What is Islamic finance? Islamic finance is equity financing, not debt financing. And equity financing means the stock market, you know, in a Sharia way, should be much more uh, ethical uh, than, you know, ESG or whatever you talk about it. Just be ethical. If you're ethical, you ESG, you see, right? So to a large extent, Malaysia, which was one of the first, you know, emerging markets to start Islamic finance, we now need to move to second stage. And second stage, if we do it right, broaden our equity market, you know, we could create an ESG green financing that is risk-based funding for projects. But who is teaching our SMEs how to make their projects ESG? Answer, nobody. You know, there are many beautiful reports being written, but they are theoretical academic reports. Who is actually going down to tell them how to do this? All right, I share with you another simple fact. You know, I was just part of a United Nations discussion over green financing. And the complaint I got people from the bankers from Hong Kong, etc. The bankers said there is no shortage of money for green projects. There is shortage of green projects. Why is that? Now, I was at the World Bank, you know. It, when I was at the World Bank, 50% of the professionals were engineers. Today, engineers, I don't know the exact number, they're very small, mostly macroeconomists, MBAs, who have never designed very complex infrastructure projects, you know, very small SME type projects, right, which require experience on the ground. So if, if I am very experienced in Bangladesh designing a green project, when I go to the World Bank, the PhD from Yale will tell me, what the hell do you know about, you know, uh, uh, green finance? Hey, I don't have a PhD, but how do I compete with you? I have seen it actually work. Oh, sorry. Uh, if it is not quoted by Joe Stiglitz or wherever it is, it doesn't really matter. You see? 
the whole Western thinking is now theory of, uh, oriented, not practice. That's my point. We really need to be much, much more practical. I would encourage the Padana professionals, okay, to really be very much more practical and start working on projects on the ground. Okay, Malaysia is not short of projects, but how to package them is a really difficult part. That's, that's a very great point. Uh, I'm going to bring another audience up. Um, uh, Ami, is that, you, you can unmute. Uh, uh, hello, question. can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you, you, Amira, for the uh, opportunity. And yeah, it's an honor to talk to you, Tansiri. Uh, uh, so before I begin with my question, I would like to draw an experience I had by chatting with one of, one of my friends currently working in Netherlands. So the story goes about semicon industry in Malaysia. So back, back then, Malaysia in the end 80s, there's already resurgences in effort in building up our own semiconductor base. Uh, Intel coming in, for example, building up their own factories. But uh, 40 years later, uh, although our semicon technology today, uh, our semiconductor uh, industry today are still better than other countries, but we are not in the highly value chain in the whole entire ecosystem of semiconductor production. Most of it is in quality checking, OSETs. But uh, our neighbor in Taiwan, in the end 80s as well, uh, they managed to fork up a joint venture with Philips. And the result from that joint venture today uh, perhaps the two most important company in the 2020s, in the 2020s, ASML and TSMC. So I would like to ask your opinion from your experience, from your working experience as well. What's not clicking in terms of transfer of knowledge from those countries who already have wealth of expertise, but set up company in Malaysia, but the transfer of knowledge doesn't seem to happen. And we are still staying in that line where we are not in the situation uh, where the supply chain, uh, where, where our industry provide highly value to the supply chain of the entire ecosystem itself. So, uh, yeah. Well, the semiconductor story is a very difficult story. If you don't get your scale up, you can't compete. And as you become even more and more nano, the amount of investments into that area gets into the billions, okay? It gets into the billions. As you know, there were two semiconductor uh, plants in Malaysia, one in Sarawak and one in uh, 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 Kulim, uh, Sutera. And, um, uh, but did you know that the chief executive of the second largest uh, um, semiconductor company, uh, Broadcom, uh, is, a, is a Penangite by the name of Tan Hock Eng? We are not short of talent in Malaysia. Okay, uh, the issue is that to today, the tech companies in, in, in Malaysia uh, um, who are in the quality control, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I just talked to somebody from Dell and I asked them, why are you in Malaysia? He said, did you know that there are 3000 engineers in Penang alone working to service uh, 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 not just Dell, but uh, uh, some of the other the firms. And in fact, you know, the number's much more than 3000, okay? So I, you know, I don't want to dwell on where we um, uh, uh, may have you know, uh, gone one way or the other. What is now much, much more important is to understand how you know, the semiconductor industry is not something that, um, uh, how shall I say, uh, that uh, small countries can easily get into without very long lead uh, in investment in people and technology. Now, Netherlands has got there because of ASML. They are the world's best manufacturer of semiconductor you know, uh, uh, manufacturing equipment. Okay? Even the Americans uh, don't have that sort of technology. Okay? But the Americans are telling the, the Dutch, don't sell to the Chinese all right, or anybody else. The, 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 you know, we should be very proud that some of uh, Sutera's chips are in fact in our iPhones, okay? Uh, uh, so, you know, not the cutting edge, but good enough, right? So to a large extent, what we now need to 
you know, look at is the niche. All right. And this is where preparing our engineers, you know, to meet the needs of the industry itself is very critical. And we in Penang, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Penang, I'm part of Wawasan Open University. Uh, we, 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 we're, we're trying to get a conversations uh, with the uh, Bayan Lepas and Kulim and all the others to, in the Northern Corridor to see how, you know, the universities uh, can work together with uh, the, these, these uh, big firms uh, on their ESG projects that can help improve the quality of labor uh, uh, and the skills uh, that can meet their needs. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but Tan would you mind if we uh, go past slightly 5 p.m. to answer a couple more questions? Sure, 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 please. Okay, great. Uh, um, Emma, if you still have your questions, you can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Tan Uh Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I was really excited to hear you speak. Uh, I grew up in Sabah, and I also went to the University of Bristol, and I went to wow. Shanghai University. <laughs> Uh, yes. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> uh, so, what well, my question is, right? Like coming from Sabah, you know, there is a lot of talk about digital economy, right? But then here we have people who can't get their vaccination appointment because they don't have internet access. Um, so, how do we, you know, make sure that growth is equitable? Well, that's my first question. Uh, sorry, I have a second question, but it's super simple. Uh, I really agree with you when you said, you know, just don't listen to just what the New York Times says or something else. So what are some publications you would recommend to us? Well, today, you know, the, the um, print media is in deep trouble, as you know. They depend, depend upon advertising. And advertising is moving on to the web. And the web has now all kinds of, I'm sorry to say, the, the information is now very problematic, okay? But I'm learning to, to, um, to go to websites that I have more trust in, okay? Uh, and if you are able to get some of these websites, you get an alternative view. So I don't necessarily believe all what I read in the, the uh, you know, the, um, the, the uh, New York Times, you know, or the Washington Post, okay, uh, uh, I, I, I just try and get, you know, as wide a spread uh, of uh, website uh, information. Uh, there, the, 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 the issue now today is that the, the big problem with social media is that if you are not careful, you only get what you like. Okay, so you, you will see this every day. You know, you, you go into the website and you click something you like. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, the advertisements, the, 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 the web articles, <clears throat> they all start coming to you in exactly what you like, not what you should be reading. So, for example, I subscribe to certain websites that I totally hate. But uh, I go in to understand them, their way of thinking. Okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have to agree with them, right? I, I, but I need to understand them. And, and so, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, so you, you really need to go to understand. I, I don't want to quote you those, those, those names because some, some of them are, in, in, in my view, really extremist, okay, mm -hmm. in, their, in their perspectives. All right? Um, uh, <clears throat> But, you know, I have to go in there to try and understand what is their point of view. Do they have one? Okay. And, and so it, the, 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 the why I try to write is to try to give you a balanced point of view. And I, I may be wrong, but I try to look at both sides of the picture. And uh, uh, the reality is we now need to have a bigger historical perspective. And the big questions of the world today are not scientific. They are moral questions. They are really moral questions. Okay? And that's why to, 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 to me, you know, I, you know uh, uh, um, I, I feel we have a moral responsibility to everybody else. And as long as we are ethical to everybody and try to be as fair as possible, then we can move forward together. You know, when we say that part doesn't count, or oh, I don't like that part, 
that's not democracy you know democracy is actually the greatest good for the greatest number what the 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 uh, democracy in america increasingly has become don't you find it obscene that the worst pandemic in a century the rich get richer by 27% i mean this is obscene <laughs> okay i'm sorry to say this this is ridiculous right i mean you would have thought that the rich would suffer together with everybody else no they get richer okay and i mean you know, it, it 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 doesn't make sense and 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 governments seem to be helpless about this right and the reason is who owns new york times you know who owns washington post okay you know, right who owns some of these big uh, uh, newspapers tycoons yeah right it's not owned by you and me it's owned by tycoons and of course they would give their point of view so whenever they say increase tax oh no 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 this this is against free market you know free <laughs> to be rich also free to be poor you see right sorry i think uh, lam kj lam has got a hands up yes you can go ahead no matter yeah hi hi everyone uh, thank you dr uh, sri for for imparting a lot of uh, wisdom here um i'm fascinated in the topic of esg because i uh, i myself work in the esg and decarbonization uh, decarbonization space the pace of change has never been so rapid so as an asian uh, working in Mel- in uh, in melbourne i have to say that australian politics is uh, is always a good laugh in terms of how they uh, how they uh, deal with china uh but i guess my question is really uh on what industry niche that uh 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 which we can look at in this new new economy of electric vehicles of re- of re- of re- uh, renewables because on one hand we we don't have the best lithium or nickel reserves we also have a shaky view point of re- uh, refining with the drama of uh, of uh, of uh, liners and things like that on the other hand we are top 3 exporter of solar panels we have a good uh, a good uh, semiconductor industry as mentioned earlier which part of the supply chain of the new economy that malaysia can uh, have an advantage and uh, cap- uh, capitalize on i guess well you know um if you if i knew that question i won't be here talking to you i'll be making my billion okay <laughs> <laughs> But let me let me <laughs> let me share with you two ideas all right the first one is why are we still going you know using foreign labor for palm oil when it's already possible to uh robotize uh actually uh, uh plucking of fruit from grapes uh the uh the chinese have now invented the robot uh to tap rubber okay right I mean, you know, the 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 you know, there are certain things that uh make a lot of sense in Malaysia but doesn't make sense why we aren't doing it. Okay? The 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 the, the, the you know, I mean, you know, if you really think about it, we used to be the one of the world's largest rubber producers. And rubber is a true tree, you know. We we Malaysians are being condemned by the the by the west for uh, creating carcinogenous uh, palm oil uh, uh, destroying the livelihoods of orang utan you know uh, deforesting uh, uh, you know you know by using palm oil okay and yet we have now the one of the world's largest rubber uh, glove producers and our rubber you know uh, uh, plantation acreage is declining when rubber producers rubber wood uh, a true forest and can have go into a hybrid uh, uh, uh production faster uh, etc etc and and can also be robotized okay right and doesn't have the uh, pollution effluence uh, like in palm oil um so to to a large extent there are many niches to do this but let me ask you uh kj which forum do you have actually sitting down with palm oil guys rubber guys manufacturing guys chemists from the universities uh etc 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 let's go into a business plan you know what was silicon valley silicon valley is five universities you know uh uh university of san francisco uh uh stanford uh uc berkeley you know uh, uh you know at you know uh, you know etc uh, etc et right the five you know five universities uh, uh caltech that's right you know etc okay and 
Caltech professors sit down every week with the Silicon Valley engineers. And they sit down in, in Starbucks and coffee houses with their young and with professors. And every day they think about what am I going to do to crack the next you know, ESG project? Name me one platform to do this in Malaysia. We don't. We don't have it, right? The universities are their own silos. The business community, their own silos. The civil service, their own silos. And they're not talking to each other. Okay? And they may come a little bit, you know, uh, when they want something. You know, then, then they'll go to a particular ministry to, to, to ask this or that. But we know we to get today lack the forum to be able to have a community conversation on where to build our ESG market niche. So everybody yeah. doing their own thing, okay? Mm. And we don't understand that what ESG other people are doing that could be adopted for ourselves to do, okay? Yeah. So for example, some idea may be already be done in uh, Singapore, but Singapore is very expensive, you know, and Malaysia is the best place to do it. You see what I'm saying? Right? Singapore mm. has no palm oil uh, estates, uh, no, you know, no rubber estates, right? No, uh, the large factories are now uh, increasingly moving out of Singapore, okay? Right? So there are ideas in Indonesia, there are ideas in Thailand, there are ideas in America, there are ideas in Latin America, many ideas which we have not adapted for our own needs. Actually, there mm. is no such thing as original invention. Everything is plagiarizing somebody's idea. Okay, we take somebody's idea, we localize it, and we succeed, right? And then we find sometimes, oh, those ideas doesn't work. You know, it may work in the West, but it doesn't work here, right? So, you know, who would have imagined that Malaysian biscuits, Malaysia is one of the best biscuit manufacturers in the world, okay? You just have to eat munchies or julies. You know, I, I went down to the, you know, an uh, African trip, a uh, Middle East trip. I went to the, the deepest area of Cambodia and Vietnam. I find Malaysian biscuits available. I was very proud. I was just, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm amazed, right? That we can actually find a market niche in this. Okay? So to a large extent, you know, we do have very good uh, uh, talent in Malaysia. Okay? Only thing is, how do we organize this to make sure that our talent goes to the next level? And it's not by accident, you know. It really is not by accident. Um, as far as ESG is concerned, I've been observing that the uh, Central Bank as well as SC, they are somewhat driving it. Do you see that as a good thing where they are driving the, the ESG movement and hopefully the rest of the industries will actually be behind them as well? Is that a good thing? Uh, I don't years? want to comment on Malaysia, okay? Let me just give you an example of what Indonesia is doing. I happen to be on the Bank Indonesia Institute. Bank Indonesia just gave a grant to 4,000 universities in Indonesia. Okay, there's that many in Indonesia, with that many large population, to do research on any topic related to ESG. Okay? So it's not about, you know, uh, a please come to me and let's talk about ESG. They actually put the money on the table. Please go and do it and then teach your students and put it in the curricula and then, you know, have the projects. Okay? So they're not giving, Bank Indonesia is not giving just to the top universities. They actually give to the universities at the grassroots level, you know, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the kampong kampong, you know? I mean, I've, you know, of course, you know, uh, uh, education standards in Indonesia vary quite a lot, but you will be surprised how much the knowledge filters down to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And this is what amazes me. You know, if Indonesia can do this, maybe we can think about it. Yeah. I think on the, a good point on education, uh, you mentioned a lot about how uh, the needs for engineers or that share in STEM is also important for, uh, for growth generally, for economic growth. Uh, and to be more innov uh, innovative, but you also mentioned how at the moment the uh, one of the most crucial things that we really need to think about is is uh, on moral issues, right? There's a question on face from Facebook here, from uh, Shafiq. 
uh, who's a senior research officer at IKIM, and he he is asking uh, where do you think or if there is a place to study humanities uh, in our, our efforts to also accelerate innovation uh, and reform education, uh, and whether this could also be sort of a, a, a basis to supply with the intellectual resources that we need to to provide that compass for for us. Well, you know, the 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 moral side of things is very much to do with family and community. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, your your moral values are very much shaped by your family and your community, right? So it's you know, uh, the whether you're taught this, um, uh, as you know, some good people become very bad people, and some bad people become good people. I mean, you know, so life is not very simple in that sense. But the 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 issue of climate change is very critical. And I used to think about uh, climate change as an economic issue. This pandemic taught me that climate change is a moral issue. Okay, it's not a technical thing. It's a moral one. Okay, it is really about whether we care about, you know, uh, 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 our people and we care about the planet. I think uh, 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 young Mulia, you know, uh, you know, the Tiwati, the, um, uh, the Sultan Nazrin, you know, has made some excellent speeches in this area. Okay. When he said that we are stewards, we are not masters. We are stewards for future generations, including stewards for nature. Okay. And therefore, we have a moral obligation to everyone and to nature. Right. And so we, we should safeguard the, the, the nature for future generations, not just exploit it for our own sake. Okay, I come from Sabah. When I grew up, we could walk from Kori Kinabalu to Sandakan under virgin jungle. Today, half of it is palm oil, right? It's the, 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 the issues are, uh, you know, you can call it for development, but at the same time, you know, my heart is, you know, is crying. You know, it's, uh, you know, I don't feel good, right? When I go back and see the scarring of the Mahmud co copper mine, you know, that's been abandoned, you know, that scars the side of uh, uh, Mount Kinabalu. So these are actually not economic issues. These are moral issues. Okay. And, and, and therefore, once we appreciate that, what we now need to do is to build within the community the sense that whatever we do, in whatever project that we do, we hope to set the direction in the right one. Okay, in, 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 we just move, you know, it's, I know it's very tough, it's very difficult, everybody will give you thousand and one reasons why it cannot be done, okay? And why I spend time with you in this afternoon on Sunday when I probably should be watching my Netflix or whatever, <laughs> uh, is because I hope I see the future in the young, okay? And I, I hope that the young will not make the same mistakes my generation made. You know, uh, my generation, the baby boomer generation, created the greatest wealth and destroyed most of the earth, okay, and left you guys with the greatest debt, okay, the debt in which you have to pay back. You know, I don't have to worry about it because I won't be here, uh, you know, fairly soon. <laughs> so, to a large extent, you know, what, 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 what I want to do is to be able to spend time, hopefully, to be able to stimulate your thinking, you know, not to influence you because you yourself judge what is right, what is wrong, you know, to, to, to just to provoke a conversation that hopefully we can move slowly in the right direction, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So education or learning the values may not be the issue. It's really to, to reflect back on our morals and what, what we think is part And practice, and practice it. Okay, it's not just about yeah. reflecting, but it's also practicing it. Okay, yeah. there are many people who do very good things on behalf of what they claim to be very holy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I I don't want to comment on these sort of very very complicated issues. Put it this way. Okay, just just do do unto others what you would do to yourself. I mean, you know, be and your own family, right? I mean, that's the thing. You know, seriously, try not to do harm. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I think that's all uh, to the question. So I think we're coming to the end of the session. But let me just sort of attempt to summarize all of these uh, great discussion and point that, that has been brought about during the discussion. So essentially to answer the question, uh, what can Malaysia do when we, we're caught in between these two giant uh, powers is uh, firstly, as much as the current position uh, to be neutral is uh, is okay and the right way for us to do we have to be smart about it about it we have to prioritize our own priorities and need you know it's not about choosing sides it's about thinking about uh, what's best for malaysia and part of that is to uh, really think about how best to build our country moving forward uh, and you know some of the things that we have to think about is you know really to to set new mindsets and uh, uh, re-establish the uh, social consensus uh, in malaysia uh, not only that, we also have to start building ecosystems to make sure that we have uh, sufficient resources to be able to, uh, you know, uh, spur innovation and to ensure that ESG uh, companies and activities and innovation also uh, thrives in Malaysia. Uh, but I think on top above all is really uh, to ensure that, um, you know, be, we be practical as well as uh, be guided on based on our own moral compass and what our own values are. Stop looking east or west, uh, look at what Malaysia and what ASEAN uh, needs and have that it can and that it can uh, thrive on. Uh, yeah, so I think before we say goodbye, uh, thank you so much. I think everyone has been uh, super um, engaged in this uh, conversation today. And I think we've actually learned a lot and re reflected on a lot. Uh, before we uh, go enjoy our Netflix on a Sunday evening, um, if we can take a quick photo on on um, on via this Zoom, uh, I think that will be the last thing before we sure. can send uh, you off to enjoy your Netflix. <laughs> yep. So if uh, participants would like to switch on your cameras, uh, we can take that picture quickly. Um, Hanif, can you do the honors? Because I, I think my current setting, it will just be my face and uh, Tan Sri's face. So, <laughs> yep. Just yeah, let me know sure, sure. Can you request for everyone to open the camera? Thank you.